Uh, my name is Gabriel Rockhill. I'm an organizer with the Philadelphia Liberation Center, as well as with the Party for Socialism and Liberation. I'm thrilled to be joined today for a discussion regarding culture as a weapon of class warfare by Claudia de la Cruz. Claudia is a popular educator, community organizer, and theologian. For over 20 years, she has been committed to movement building and has actively participated in collective grassroots spaces, particularly in the communities of Washington Heights and the South Bronx. She's currently the co-executive director of the People's Forum, where she contributes her experiences and skills in the creation of cultural educational space with organizers, educators, and cultural workers. In 2004, she co-founded the Urban Butterflies Youth Leadership Development Project, and her experiences with this project informed her participation in the development of cultural and political education programming at the Rebel Diaz Arts Collective for almost five years. She also recently published an important edited collection entitled Viveremos, Venezuela versus Hybrid War. It's my pleasure to introduce Claudia de la Cruz. Thank so you as so much, <laughs> Gabriel. Good to be in conversation with you. Absolutely. As the director of the People's Forum, you've been deeply involved in both cultural analysis and public pedagogy. So the first question I'd like to ask you is why, in your opinion, is culture important to political education? What role does it play? And how can it contribute to people's understanding and sense of the world? So for us, culture is at the heart of our conception of and relationship to the world. And we are talking about culture in the broader sense. Sometimes we speak about culture and folks directly go into the arts, right? Um, but we're talking about culture and we mean everything from the way we cook to how and what we eat to what we consider art or not, or what constitutes education or not. Um, how we are taught to understand ourselves and those around us to the religion we practice or how our faith is shaped. Like this is our broad understanding of what culture is, even the relationship of, of human beings and systems to what the land is and the cultivation of land. Like all of this is part of culture. And so culture is all mechanisms that have been created to shape our understanding and our behaviors and our relationships. And all this relation, um, all these relations have an economic base uh, that dominates the creation of these mechanisms and institutions and how these have impacted our organizations and our struggles as part of the working class. And so for us, um, looking at, at that definition in relationship to political uh, education as we understand it um, is really important. Because when we talk about political education it's not simply educating or being educated for the sakes of, not, of, of accumulating knowledge, right? That's not what we understand political education to be. Um, but political education to raise our people's confidence to effectively have a political intervention in the world in order to advance our class struggle. That's our understanding of political education. Therefore, understanding our history of oppression, but also of liberation is important. Understanding culture as both the result of a people's history and also as a determining factor of a people's history is key for us. Um, and, and the organizations that we work for or work with to understand that, you know, when we're talking about culture is not just an addendum or an accessory. We're talking about something that needs to be at the center of what our work is. And it forces us to take the task of unraveling um, and deconstructing the culture that has been imposed on us by the bourgeoisie that is sustained and ensures the reproduction of capitalism um, and it challenges us to take on the task of reclaiming and reconstructing the lineage. We, in Spanish, often talk about, um, you know, in la memoria histórica, the historical memory and how to like, we reconstruct that. Um, and how do we, you know, integrate what cultural resistance is to every aspect of our life and also our, our, of our education and study. Um, and how do we go back to the authentic people's culture, right? La, la resistencia y la cultura popular. 
Um, we're currently experiencing a deep crisis that is economic, that is social, that is political, that is environmental at a global scale. And, you know, we understand that this crisis is a product of capitalism. And there's also an ideological piece to it, you know, that has um, been an ideological warfare to us. And so when we're talking about, you know, resistance, we want to also engage in the battle of ideas. We want to be able to be equipped to be able to understand how our, you know, and I guess we'll talk a little bit more of that further down the line, but how have we been oppressed and how have nations through imperialism, through cultural imperialism have also been oppressed, exploited and continue to be. And so when we're talking about political education in relationship to cultural resistance is we think it's one in the same, like it's part uh, integrate, like an, an integral part of, of the struggle and organizing, but also of our study. Great, why is it important to reflect on and understand the expansiveness of culture beyond just the restricted category of, of art? Mm -hmm. I mean, I think it's important um, and we, we think about it a lot in the people's form and the work that we do, um, mostly because we understand that, again, we need to look at the questions of how do we combat a culture that promotes hyper individualism, consumerism, ignorance? How do we, uh, as organizers and educators, not only challenge those values and added attitudes, but also model and provide a radical imagination for for future? You know, in our efforts to build a new society, how do we inspire people? How do we move them, the hearts and minds of people? How do we think about culture in relationship to political organization and the way in which our, or, like the culture of our organizations? How do we think about people's resistance? Um, and, and so these are all questions that we are kind of struggling through, through and moving through and, and trying to, to explore collectively. We, again, we are experiencing a crisis uh, of values and an ideological warfare from the capitalist. And so how we equip ourselves to fix, effectively be part of the class struggle is dependent on how clear is our understanding of the mechanisms and processes that the elite have built to wage war against us, right? And so when we talk about occupation, we, we often not talk about the mental terrain as an occupied space. You know, and, and the mental terrain of the masses has been occupied. And so it's very important for us to understand how that's happened, how that continues to happen, um, or else we often fall in blaming our people for not understanding what we're trying to talk about. Um, and we, we need to know that it's been hundreds of years, many generations of, of, um, of imposed cultural understandings and practices and attitudes by the capitalists. Um, so again, in order for us to effectively intervene and move people's hearts and minds towards our class interests, um, we need to be able to know where the mental terrain of our people is. And so we need to be able to study the mechanisms that have been utilized by the, by the ruling class. Um, for us, it is impossible to gain a depth or a breath of, of the importance of art and culture as a weapon if we do not refer to history, to the economy, to the way in which we have been taught by the elite to perceive reality. Um, and equally important, the task of taking time to study and learn and reclaim the ways in which we, um, our people have also utilized working class culture as, as a defense mechanism um, and preser the, the preservation and in uh, imagining and constructing our own reality of liberation. Like Amilcar Cabral spoke to that. Chavez knew exactly how to do that. Um, we, when we look at Claudia Jones, at Fidel, at Celia Sanchez, and so many others that had been engaged in national liberation struggle, they have understood the importance of culture, the study and analysis of culture, and the reclaiming of cultural resistance. Um, and so it is critical for us to be able to engage in that way and give it that, that much of importance um, if we're, if we're going to move our, our struggles forward. Like if we think about the ways in which capitalists have, um, you know, corporations, the government have historically taken the language of the people, you know, the struggles of the people, whitewash them, and then sell it back to us to advance their interests. Like we, we're, this is Pride Month, right? Like, 
people often refer to pride in relationship to a parade, right? But not in relationship to the riots, <laughs> um, not in relationship to, you know, the LGBTQ community that came forth, trans women, um, that came forth and actually linked, uh, you know, the, the, the riots to capitalism and the struggle for liberation. Like people don't often think, think about that because the system has a way of taking these, these spaces of struggle again and appropriating them and selling them back to us. They, they make these, these struggles a commodity. Memorial Day and its relationship to the, um, the, the Black community that was actually celebrating <laughs> They're martyrs, like they're, and it's taken whitewashed and sold back to us as a day of celebration that the capitalists actually give us, I don't know, what, 30% discounts at stores and everybody needs to go shopping, right? Um, MLK Day, right? And we could go on and on and on. These are all, these, these all have had roots in struggle. These are all products of a social opposition to social, economic, and political exclusion and exploitation. But somehow they've been appropriated and wiped out of their radical roots into empty radical de declarations and symbolic acts, right? After a long and heated summer last year of anti-racist rebellions, all sorts of capitalist corporations have pronounced themselves to be sympathetic to the Black Lives Matter struggle. And yet they continue to extract and exploit Black and Brown labor in and out of the states, right? So these are all contradictions that we need to be able to identify and we need to be able to use in our, in our education efforts within our community so that people understand that capitalism is not being nice to us. Capitalism doesn't really like us. On the contrary, like it feeds off our blood and sweat and the way in which they gain, gain uh, consent and you know, not only through like physical force, is through the occupation of our mental terrain. You know, it's making us believe that there's a certain type of liking us and being with us. And so we need to be able to start analyzing how that's happening and deconstructing how that's happening and reconstructing a new way of thinking and relating to these mechanisms. I take it then that for you, culture is really a, a central site of class struggle. And you've given some excellent examples of how the capitalist ruling class and their hench people within the culture industries mm -hmm. will recuperate radical events. What about the other side of class struggle, meaning class struggle from below on the part of the working and toiling masses to define their own culture, to manifest their own mm -hmm. forms of cultural belonging and popular education, et cetera. How would you see the kind of opposite end of the spectrum or are there particular examples of reclaiming culture that is people's culture that you'd wanna to point to in this regard? I mean, if you think about, I mean, and that's an excellent question, thinking about ways of, in which like cultural resistance lives right and if we think about the palestinian struggle which is something that is very like right now i mean it's constant right but right now um there have been mass mobilizations all around and including in the united states and we always see something we always see kafias and we always see the daca dance <laughs> and these are cultural experience expressions of resistance right um and we might see them and we've like in, in the, just in the movement and in struggle have normalized them so that it's normal, right? But, um, and it, it must be normal and it continue to be normalized. And yet these are forms of cultural expression. They all have some sort of cultural uh, relation to the land of Palestine, to the people of, of Palestine, right? And so we see that um, our chance, like when we are, out about and protesting, there there are chants, right? And I think often about the um, you know, the slave in the hymns of the slaves, you know, the songs that were sang in the plantation or that that were sang in in the churches where that was kind of like the safe space for a lot of the slaves, right? Like these are part of our cultural resistance. We we create spaces 
we reclaim the history um, through our food, you know. Um, like I'm Dominican in the Dominican Republic when we're talking about leaving religiosity and the imposed Christianity, you know, people actually had to go to church because they were forced to go to church by the colonizers. But when they came back home in the privacy of their home, they had altars to Ochun, to Yemaya, to Elegua, right? Who connected them spiritually to the source of strength, right? And we often talk about mystica in Latin America and the Caribbean. And that mystica is the spirit of struggle. And we find the mystica everywhere. We come together as a community and we reclaim our history and we reclaim our lineage. Um, you know, and this happens in meetings. This, everywhere you look, there's there's cultural expressions of resistance of our people. Um, and, and I think more than anything, there is a certain significance to acknowledging that, because that's also how we learn not to just normalize it, but to understand why they're there. That's really fascinating because it juxtaposes so well to what you were saying earlier about the kind of atomizing forces of cultural production under capital. And it strikes me that one of the things that you're highlighting with popular culture is its ability to create both communities and then historical legacies of mm -hmm. peoples, right? So it's not just about uh, individual experiences, it's actually about forging a people and potentially forging them in new and creative ways. Mm -hmm. So I don't, I don't know if this interpolates you, but I'd love to hear a little bit more about culture as a force of community building and historical anchoring that allows people to move from being an isolated individual consumer to actually being part of a movement, being part of a people, being part of liberation struggles more generally. I mean, I think it's important to, you know, kind of to raise like we who are part of a liberation movement, um, of a liberation struggle, we have the task not only of creating a new society, but we also have the task of creating new human beings with new politics, new ideas, new values, new principles. And in order for us to be able to do that, we need to be in touch with that history, with that lineage, with that building of community, with that process of deconstructing and reconstructing. And it's a very tough, you know, tough task to do, but we have historically been taught that it can be done. Um, and so, you know, this aspect of, of building community and be, building the new human being, it's not a mechanical one. It's pretty much an organic process that has a lot of political intention. There's a lot of political intentionality of why we do what we do and how we do it, right? Because we're also very understanding that capitalism has been very intentional in the way in which it has attacked us and the way in which it has kind of dropped in their ideas and values to serve their purpose. And so um, again, in the process of building our community, in the process of building our political organizations, the type of culture, the type of structure, the processes, the systems are what will ultimately show that community that there's a possibility of building something new. You know, it will attract uh, folks, ordinary folks into the space that will have problems and will be challenged by that new way of operating. And, you know, our capacity to be able to uh, understand that and struggle through with our community as they adjust, it's also very telling about how will we act when we actually gain political and economic power, right? And so if we, if we take the moment in which we are in as a, as a test of how do we develop, you know, the systems, the mechanisms, the processes, this new culture, these new human beings, um, then we will be more ready to be able to advance towards getting economic and political power, which should always be, you know, the aim of class struggle. Um, because that's another, you know, I think difference in the United States and, and United, the movements, a lot of the movements in the United States uh, versus, you know, the global South. We are constantly in struggle. And because we have been, something's been ingrained in us that we are against bureaucracy, that we are against order, that we are against all these things, 
we often fight against capitalism, but we don't say what we are fighting for and what we want to establish. And it's an economic and political and social fight that we're in, right? And so um, again, I think the aspect of culture as we organize, as we educate, as we build organization is important for us to keep as a very intentional aspect of our work, you know? Um, and think about it, not as an accessory, you know, but something that we need to take really seriously as part of our political practice and part of our developing political theory. What role do you see artists, writers, and, and cultural producers playing in this process? Uh, in other words, how are their contributions maybe similar to, but also different from other activists who are struggling for socialism and liberation? And maybe even more specifically, what do you see in the current context of the 21st century in the United States as uh, the real possibilities for developing power for revolutionary artists to really be able to contribute more directly to these types of struggles? Well, I think we're in a very hopeful space. I mean, we're in a crisis, but we're also in a very hopeful space because um, the contradictions of capitalism are way more visible. They're more, they're more out in our face. And that gives an opportunity for those folks that are the producers of culture, right? Folks that are uh, creating the creative for like the creative forces um, to be able to highlight what those contradictions are, but also put forth what the radical imagination for the future looks like. And I think when we are in a moment of crisis, it's very, um, it's not difficult for people to be able to be moved by those who are highlighting what those contradictions are, because we are feeling that what that, you know, what the economic crisis looks like, what the social and political crisis looks like. So it's basically the, um, it's a mass expression, right? Or mass, uh, mass sentiment that is expressed by these artists or these cultural workers in a way that we cannot say or expre express or paint. And so there, there is an opportunity now, right? And there have been opportunities like these historically. Um, what the role of an artist, I think, is, is very challenging because it challenges the idea of an individual practice. <laughs> um, people have been taught that, you know, and I think Erica Badu was really key when she said, you know, artists are sensitive about their ish. Um, they are sensitive, right? And at the same time, their task, if they have uh, a commitment to social change, to economic change, um, just to transformation in the world, there is a challenge of working with organizations. And we see that in the life of Paul Robeson. We see that in the life of, you know, Claudia Jones even as well as a journalist, you know, she's a communist, she was a journalist, right? Um, and, and, you know, she organized festivals. Like, we see this in the life of Nina Simone. We see that, like, we see it in the life of Frida Kahlo, right? A lot of people love Frida, but they forget she was a communist. So, like, these folks have been connected or been part of political organization. They were the militant artist arm <laughs> of organizations, right? And some, you know, who obviously I haven't named were connected to in some part form to movement, right? Harry Belafonte, for example, right? And so you have uh, folks that have committed themselves and have committed their art beyond, you know, their individual interests. And so the role of the artist is to do precisely that, is to be able to interpret the world um, in a way that that expresses what reality is and what reality can be. I had a, a good friend that talked about, you know, hieroglyphics and spoke to like um, the drawings and caves and how they remained as a part of history of what was happening at that particular time. And the question is, what will be left for future generations to refer to, you know, to this moment? And that's part of the role of the artist 
you know, of the intellectual. Um, and so, you know, the contributions are different for everyone. Everyone has a different role to play, you know, intellectuals, artists, uh, you know, frontline organizers, everybody has a role to play. Um, and everybody has something that they've developed their expertise in. And so we can, I can't, as someone who's, I'm a cultural organizer, but I'm not a cultural worker. I'm not an artist, you know, and I have produced, um, you know, pieces. And yet at the same time, I have to honor the fact that there are people who do that and that's their craft and that's the way in which they contribute, you know? And so I think that there's a level of respect that we also need to have for the craft and the expertise of each other, but understanding these different contributions as part of a larger struggle is important. Um, and I think, you know, in the current moment, again, it's a hopeful time and what we do at this particular moment, this particular conjuncture will determine decades. If we lose this moment, you know, we'll be moving back 50 years. That's not even a joke, you know, it's real. And so there's a level of urgency for, for artists to understand that one of the reasons why why there's so there there has been a level of suffering in this particular economic crisis and the pandemic and folks have had lost spaces and gigs and all of this that's also part of the way in which capitalism has kind of structured itself um where it's time for artists and cultural workers to assume themselves as part of the working class you know is that time is that time when we actually connect and are in conversation with and are producing and creating in relationship to movement, in relationship to organization, in relationship to the collective um, in order to advance class struggle. That's such an important point, Claudia, because within consumer society, there's such a high premium that's placed on individualism, competition, and the creation ultimately of a kind of artistic elite in which to even call oneself an artist or an intellectual, one needs to be recognized by the extant institutions and have exhibitions in certain spaces and other such things. And it really creates uh, what can be quite pernicious hierarchies where other thinking, working people who are doing creative acts are consigned to a kind of amateurish status or cannot refer to themselves as intellectuals because they're, they're activists and they don't have a certain pedigree from universities and other such things. So I was wondering if you could address as well this other aspect of the kind of atomizing forces of capitalism that identify only select individuals as you know, true cultural producers or real artists or prominent intellectuals and the masses and their creative labor power is then made absolutely secondary to that. And so, well, I think you're absolutely right to point out the importance of recognizing specialization in craft and an ability to do certain things. What do you make of this kind of hierarchy of creative labor power where the very label of artist or intellectual is, is restricted to only a, a select elite group? I, mean, I think it's important in our work also, yes, there is a certain, there is importance in specialization and craft. There's importance in that. And then there's also importance in allowing our people, the working class to understand that we're in the aspect of cultural production every day. <laughs> like we do it every day, right? Um, again, if we think about culture in the broader sense of the world, of the word, and people are definitely also creating artistic expressions every day, right? And so I think um, part of our task is pointing out how we do that. It's pointing out how in an organization, even if, you know, political organization, grassroots organization, even if we're not claiming to be cultural producers, how are we doing it is important, you know? Um, how are we coming together? How are we eating together? What foods are we eating together? What chants are we building together? How do we get together to do art builds for protests? Like these are all part of the production 
of art and culture. Um, and again, we don't necessarily think about it in that way because we've been taught to think about that hierarchy, right? Our people are producing intellectual knowledge every day, you know? And yet a lot of the times when we, when we talk to organizers, they're like, oh no, I'm not into theory. Like I'm not into, you know, studying theory. Like that's old white people thing. That's, that's kind of a response that a lot of folks have. And it's again, the misconceptions of what we have been taught to believe because for as long as we are detached from the role of production and we're simply consumers, capitalism has the upper hand because we have no value. Where in reality, as workers, whether we are culture, like culture workers or workers, you know, in the transit, like whatever play, wherever we are, we are producing. And that's what gives capitalism what it has. And therefore we have value, right? So this concept of confidence that has been stripped away from us is very key in organizing. How do we build up our people's confidence grounded in history, right? Um, and the more that we're able to do that, the more we're able to fight against these statuses that have been created by capitalism only to keep us detached from our, from what we are capable of doing, you know, only to take away our possibility and our power um, to build revolution, to build liberation, to build community even. And so, you know, it, first it's important to, to uh, understand that there is a hierarchy in that way, you know, and again, the political intentionality of deconstructing that in our day to day and the work that we have with our people is important. Um, not assuming the capitalist principles and values that if we see someone who's homeless, this person has no value. And it might be that this person who's homeless that capitalism has made homeless has expertise in things that could contribute in building political organization, but we haven't taken the time to have that conversation, right? Um, and so I think, you know, it's, it's highly important for us to know our, know our people, know the mechanisms that have been used against us, and start deconstructing that in our day to day, not, not, not as a theoretical exercise, but as a practical exercise that then becomes theory. Let's talk a little bit more explicitly about the power structures that are in place and why it is sometimes difficult to do some of the things that you're encouraging us to do. More specifically, I'd like to invoke uh, the work of Bertolt Brecht, who refers to what he calls the cultural apparatus, right? And this is the entire means of cultural production, cultural circulation, and also the reception of cultural products. And that that cultural apparatus, at least within a country like the United States, is currently in the hands of the capitalist ruling class. So they have an awesome power to be able to produce and distribute the culture that they decide on. And you mentioned this earlier, we kind of skipped over it, but if you want to go back to it, I'd be happy to. This also is not simply a cultural apparatus within the United States, but it's an imperialist cultural apparatus. Mm -hmm. So I'd be curious to hear you more on what the stakes of this struggle really are and why it's important not simply to, um, you know, look in our immediate communities, but also have an awareness of these systems of power that are in place in order to make sure as much as possible that the power isn't bequeathed to the people. And so what's it mean really to think through the, you know, even the possibility of seizing the means of cultural production, circulation and reception. I know that you've done a lot of work on socialist or socialistically oriented countries that have done precisely that. And so I'd be curious, I know that I'm packing a lot into this particular question, but to hear you on uh, the need to kind of critically reflect on this capitalist um, cultural apparatus and its imperial elements. I, mean, I think it's important. I'm, I'm so happy you brought, brought in Brooks and Vincent Brooks um, because he, he, along you know, with folks like Gramsci and other folks, really, really thought a lot about question of cultural apparatus and relationship to capitalism um, 
and the way in which, you know, systemically and institutionally, um, these are are meant to be able to advance capitalist uh, interests. Um, and to, like, I think it's important to be able to understand that when we're talking about culture, again, we're not talking about the development of something in a vacuum. It has an economic base to it. Um, when we look at revolutionary processes, whether it be Cuba, Venezuela, Vietnam, China, there was a reclaiming of like indigenous cultural aspects to these nations, right? Um, in Cuba, you have Jose Martí, you know, as a figure um, that was that was known to the masses, right? Because of the struggle against Spaniards and um, and towards the independence of Cuba. In Venezuela, you have Simón Bolívar as a figure that was that is known not only in Venezuela, again, worldwide and in the continent of the Americas, you know? And so there's this tapping into the memory of, of people, right? But that's not done by itself. It's connected to the socioeconomic program, socioeconomic and political program, right? Um, and that's highly important to say because one of the things that, you know, Fidel spoke often about in relationship to the battle of ideas is that ideas on their own don't really mean much. They have to have a social economic project that is able to move the masses. Like the masses need to get behind that idea in order for us to be able to win. And it is challenging and it's um, difficult when we're talking about cultural production, circulation and reception if we don't have the economic and political power, right? Um, that means we need to build it. That's what it means, that, it, that we need to be able to build the conditions that will allow us to be able to have a level of dominance culturally as a working class. And, you know, again, it fights the idea that, um, we're creating for just for creation's sake, or that we're creating creating to be in struggle all all the time. No, we are creating to win, and therefore, whatever we create needs to be connected to a social, economic, and political proposal of what we will do and how we will do towards that moment of win and after. And so, it needs to be connected to a program. Um, to be able to kind of shift the powers and be able to build, uh, for lack of words, a cultural apparatus for the working class or with the working class, we need to build the revolution. And so pending that revolution, we need to figure out how do we do that in a way that is not only nationally done, but it's also in relationship and conversation with those who've done it. So we have to be in conversation and study the Cuban revolution from an aspect of its cultural development, its revolutionary cultural development. We have to do the same with Venezuela. We must do the same with Vietnam. We need to make sure that we understand very well um, the Chinese revolution, <laughs> right? Um, and I'll, I'll refer back to Amica Cabral again. You know, It's very difficult to penetrate a nation if there is strength in its culture. Cultural imperialism has been kind of like the key to a lot of what's come after, like McDonald's, Starbucks, all these corporations have integrated in themselves, I mean, have imposed themselves in these nations in a way that have, you know, diminished the value of what's nas nationally produced, right? And it's the same thing in our communities. When we think about, you know, the local the local coffee shop and a Starbucks or a Dunkin' Donuts, like all these franchises that come in, and even though they're more expensive, there's a certain level of status that comes from walking around with a cup that has Starbucks on it, right? And so these are part of that cultural apparatus that is working um, at a local, national, and international 
way. And so we need to be able to understand how that works in relationship to the economy and create, you know, what alternatives could be. Um, and that's not to say that, you know, it's going to be plainly socialist in this capitalist society, but we're, we're experimenting. And that's, I think that, that that's the key part of it. We're experimenting. Um, and we can't be afraid of experimenting. When I think about, you know, that I think about the different spaces in which I've been, a, you know, I've been a part of and worked in and think about the People's Forum. Like, these are all experiments um, in the midst of a capitalist system attempting to build that new culture, right, of relating, of uh, building community. And so, you know, to think about a culture apparatus, like, and I know that for a lot of people who are organizing and even engaged with the theory is like, man, this is huge. And it is, it's so huge. And not one organization and not one person can actually shift what that is. But we need to be, again, more creative, more intentional, more willing to experiment in conversation with the local, in conversation with the national and in conversation with the international to be able to find what is it that is gonna move this struggle forward. Again, it cannot be done isolated from a social, economic and political program. It has to be part of organization. To take just two examples where the working class was able to seize the means of production, the Soviet Union in 1917, of course, the Cuban revolution. It's interesting that in both cases, of course, and we could point to others, there was an intense focus on culture and cultural transformation and the kind of making of the new human being that you were alluding to earlier. I'm curious to hear your thoughts on some of the debates, really important debates, I think, that emerged at these times were around the relationship between a kind of emerging socialist cultural apparatus on the one hand, but then a deep history of art that was being made under either feudal social relations or under capitalism. Uh, in particular in the Soviet Union, but the same is true of Cuba, right? There were debates about what should we do with the bourgeois art <laughs> that surrounds us, the art that has been made under capitalism, paid by uh, capitalists, et cetera. Should we just delete it and abolish it and start afresh? Are there things to be tapped into and learned from? What's your sense of the relationship between these emerging socialist countries and the kind of deep cultural patterns that are dominant under capitalism or even, even under feudalism? So, it, you know, I, I like to go always to, I love Gramsci. So I used to often refer to, to him and obviously he was a Marxist Leninist and that's so, always, always so good to be able to uplift because, well, you know, cultural Marxism kind of kidnaps him and says that he's not, but he was a Marxist Leninist. He, he talked about, you know, the, the, the good sense and the common sense and how when we are talking about, you know, creating new ways, we all always have to take into consideration what the common sense is, you know, where people are at in order to be able to tap into what they know and shift that to, you know, what is good sense? What is the mass? What, what is our interest as a working class? And so, you know, going back to, the USSR and, and the revolution um, and their understanding of art and, and just culture and generally, it's important to say that, you know, the, the main um, consigna, like the, the main saying was art for the people, art for life. That was something that uh, Vladimir Tatlin said. And it was the understanding that, you know, no longer for the bourgeoisie, no longer for the aristocrat, art would now be for the people. Um, and the art market was to be abolished. Museums were to be nationalized. The worker state became arts patron. Like it's for the people because, you know, ultimately the producers, the producers of art are workers. Those who are accumulating it are the capitalists. Right. And so these are the folks that are making the galleries that are setting the boundaries in museums that are saying this is art and this is not art. Right. And so um, it brings the question of nationalizing it, socializing it, um, making it accessible for the people. And 
you know, it, that brings forth like massive amounts of opportunities for people to understand themselves also as cultural producers and uh, producers and act artists and engage in learning, you know, artistic traits um, and understanding it as part of their labor as well, which is what's happened in Cuba, which is what's happened in Venezuela. You know, uh, they have what we don't have in the United States, which are the ministries of art and culture which is something that the USSR also had. And although we in the United States don't have a ministry of arts and culture, we do have a policy. <laughs> and that policy is art for the wealthy and life for the wealthy. And that's it. And you could see it, you know, again, in the way in which, you know, certain art is valued. And when it's valued even, because when you think about in the United States, when you think about graffiti in the 1980s, it was vandalizing and somehow it shifted into street art and now everybody wants to have murals, right? And so um, again, I think when we're thinking about uh, the USSR, when we're thinking about Cuba, when we're thinking about Venezuela is understanding that art needs to be socialized. Um, that, there, that more than um, getting rid of bourgeois art, is about getting rid of bourgeois institutions, getting rid of bourgeois systems that allow for capitalists to accumulate art and make profit from art that is produced by cultural workers, right? Um, that there is more of an opening to be able to express yourself artistically by mirroring realities, by putting forth, you know, um, what your imagination is about the future in relationship to the masses, right? Like all, that is what I, I believe and I understand happened in these revolutions. And I think, you know, it's something for us to think about. There are current, like, there have been a lot of um, protests here in, the, in, in New York City around MoMA and other, and, and other museums. Um, and the organizers have done really well in connecting, you know, both the imperialist acts of a lot of the folks that are in their boards and like, and their connection to cultural imperialism, but also the extraction of wealth for the gains of the capitalists in the United States. And the connection to cultural workers that are basically pushed out of the opportunity of being in these spaces, right? And we need to do more of that. Again, because it's not, it's not something that is simply based on this cultural worker that produces this piece of art. It's systemic, it's institutional, you know? It's part of the capitalist structure that is global, that is not simply local or national, you know? Um, and so, yeah, when we're, when we're, we're thinking about the social estates and the histories of art, we need to look at the ways in which they were nationalized, they were socialized, and they became accessible to the most ordinary worker to be able to elevate our understanding of culture and art and our capacity to be able to be engaged with it and create it. That's such an important point. You know, Claudia, there are so many writers and artists and intellectuals who are involved in the movement, but who are also looking for examples to learn from, right? Given that most of the artists, musicians, and writers that are readily available within the kind of capitalist apparatus of art production, most people will know, you know, Beyonce or others, but they won't necessarily be aware of those artists who have been either marginalized or structurally excluded from this system of artistic promotion for the bourgeoisie. Are there particular artists, movements, uh, platforms for sharing artwork that you would recommend to cultural producers involved in the movement who wanna learn more about what revolutionary art making really looks like. Sure. Um, so I, I, because I'm like a, I'm such a geek, um, <laughs> and I'm around good geeks like Gabriel too, and other folks. 
Um, I'm, I'm really um, invested in learning more about, you know, culture workers and artists who have meant um, a lot to our lineage and our radical traditions. Uh, there's this book, The, the Cultural Front, that I really like. Um, and it speaks to the CPUSA front of culture workers that were anti-fascist, that were anti-capitalist, you know, that were socialist um, and attempting to build something new in the United States. And um, that's a great book. Uh, I know, um, and I'm looking over here at my desk because I have like a stack of, <laughs> stack of books. Um, the book on the Cold War is also a, a good book. Um, the Cultural Cold War. And that book also speaks to the way in which like the CIA and different um, surveillance uh, institutions have operated in funding, financing the art and cultural world. And I think that that's important also for us to understand, you know, the role of think tanks and the role of, you know, just uh, Wall Street <laughs> um, and, and, and different, uh, again, intelligence agencies. I love Paul Robeson deeply. Um, Paul Robeson's story is is really great. There's a there's a book on Paul Robeson and his relationship to W. E. B. Du Bois that is really good it's called on um, the professor and the uh, the pupil. Um, there are in terms of platforms we at the People's Forum has have actually created a platform that is uh, of political education and it has a uh, space for and on cultural hegemony um, and cultural resistance and the battle of ideas. So there's resources there. Amilcar Cabral also speaks to national liberation and culture. Um, you know, a, there are speeches from Fidel, particularly Fidel's speech to the intellectuals, uh, which is really great. Uh, to think about the role of the artist, right, in the process of building revolution, um, you know, I mean, there's so there's so many resources out there. the The problem again is the accessibility and actually being able to identify what they are. Um, there, there are a lot of um, artist collectives in the U.S. that are now questioning, you know, their role in this moment, um, and that's a good place to be in, right? And I think that um, they are objectively doing the work of those cultural workers that are moving towards socialism and are moving socialism forward in the country, but they might not be claiming to be socialists. And that's another thing that we have to be clear about as organizers that folks may not claim it, but we need to see what their objective work looks like. And if it's aligned with you know, our politics, most likely they will get there. They will get to the point of self-proclaiming that they're socialists, but it takes a little bit longer, especially in the, in the art world and in the culture work um, spaces. And so, you know, there's just a lot to draw from historically in terms of folks who have attempted to build, you know, cultural funds, collectives, organize themselves more politically as cultural workers. Um, and I'm, I'd be more than happy to share some, although I know you might have a lot of that, Gabriel, as well. well maybe we can add a kind of further reading section to the, mm -hmm. to the interview. In the interest of time, I might just ask a final question to kind of bring some of the threads of this really rich and um, rewarding conversation that we've had thus far. And that is a question on cultural revolution. It strikes me that this is kind of lingering in the background of a lot of what you've said. And if we put it very simplistically, there are those who have argued that, well, art is a liberatory force unto itself. And there are others who have claimed that, no, we have to seize the means of production and then we can revolutionize art post, you know, revolution. And it strikes me that what you've been saying is, is something a bit more dialectical, I guess, right? Mm -hmm. That these material struggles for building power as cultural producers go hand in hand with the ideological struggles of expanding our understanding of culture and then working as cultural producers in various ways. And so I don't wanna answer the question for you in the way that I've put it together, but I'm really curious to hear you on the logics of cultural revolution and how the kind of 
material aspects of the socioeconomic relate to the ideological aspects of struggle based on what you've said thus far. How do you understand cultural revolution? So I think that there's like some key elements right to to the work and it's definitely like dialectic like it's not something like we'll, we'll when we get there we'll do this like we need to be able to gain some i'm sorry you might okay yeah, you ate breakfast okay papa fed you cereal okay yeah and then you're gonna have lunch okay all right sorry we should, we should keep that in there, but that's, <laughs> we'll probably edit it out. So go oh. ahead, pick, pick, pick two. <laughs> okay, so I think that um, so some of the thing, some of what I've shared has to do with like redefining, reclaiming, reactivating, and understanding art as an action that is a political action. Understanding it as a pedagogical instrument for the construction of the new consciousness that we're trying to build, of the new society that we're trying to build, of the development of political strategy even, right? Sometimes we don't even think about art in relationship to that. Um, thinking about art and culture as a emancipatory uh, tool of the working class, um, as a tool of communication, as a, you know, as a space for human development. Like these, all these things are important to take into, into consideration. And to think about uh, cultural revolution, we must also think about some key elements. And it's, um, you know, um, that that when we're talking about culture and we're talking about art, it needs to be from, by, and to the people. And it has to have the concerns of the masses. Um, the expression of working class interests, right? Um, it has to have elements of the day-to-day -day. and it has to also push forward the route of a socialist future like this is this is what i've learned from studying engaging being within you know socialist revolutions that have won culture is at the heart the music the dance the food the sports the faith traditions, you know, um, and the respect for those. And when we're talking about, you know, cultural revolution, like like you mentioned, it is a, it, it's like it's dialectic. It's not something that comes afterwards. It's something that is part of a political strategy. It has to be, you know. Um, if you were to like, there is a, a uh, the way of communicating, the way of relating the tonality, the, you know, again, going back to the food, going back to the things that just make our day-to-day -day life, that it's very hard to penetrate when it's you. That's who you are. That's your identity, right? Um, and part of the process of any cultural, like, revolution is affirming that identity. To think about Cuba is to think about a country that is very firm in its Cuban identity. And it's very knowing of imperialism. And it understands that it doesn't want to go back to being a slave to imperialism because they're very sure about their cultural identity, right? And so to think about cultural revolution is to think about social, economic, and political revolution. It's not in addition to, it's part of it, right? Um, what happens within the revolution is that then we go into deepening that revolution. Like we've won, now we're going to deepen what the revolution is. And so there are other aspects of culture that come into play there. Now there's a production of knowledge from a socialist perspective. Now there's pro the, their production of, uh, of TV shows that bring forth what we understand, you know, is the preoccupation and the interest of the working class, right? But as we're working towards getting to a place where we win, we have to, like we must, be able to not leave it aside, but put culture at the center and have it be part of the work that we're doing um, so that it becomes an organic piece to, to what we understand revolution to be. You know? Well, that's an excellent place to wrap up. <laughs> Thank you so much, Claudia, for taking the time to speak to us today about 
culture as a weapon of, of class warfare. Well, thank you for inviting me and allowing me to talk about one of my favorite topics in the world. <laughs>